On tonight's show, I want to know, do we keep buying stocks or should we be scared about inverted yield curves and a possible recession? I'm not worried, but you'd probably say, oh, he's always optimistic. It's not true, but people think that. But what about uh, my guest, Julia Lee of Berman Invest? What is she thinking? Chris Joy of Coolabar Investments, Charlie Aitken of Aitken Investment Management, and of course, Paul Rickard of The Switzer Report. We'll ask them what they think about the environment for buying stocks right now. Are they scared? And we'll finally talk to the small business ombudsman, Kate Cunnell, about what she wants to do to fix wage rises in this country. That's the show for tonight. Without any further ado, let's go to Julia Lee. And my first guest, of course, is Julia Lee from Vermin Invest. Julia, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. There's a whole lot of stuff going on at the moment, you know, inverted yields in the bond market, recession headlines, and earnings season as well. They kind of dropped into the background, haven't they, earnings season? What have you, what's your take on what you've seen so far? First of all, reporting season is really important because it gives us an insight into trends. And I think that's the most valuable part of reporting season. Going back to last August reporting season and having a look at the top 10 performers in the ASX 200 yeah. and the bottom 10% 10 performers, uh. just in terms of price performance. I mean, looking at the best 10, and for that month, we saw the share price of those 10 increasing by 31%. Since then, up to the start of this reporting season, we've right. seen another increase of 17% for those stocks. But what's interesting are the bottom performers. And generally, when you see the bottom performers, people right. think they're getting a bargain. Mm. For the month of August, they dropped 20% on average, but mm. since then, dropped another 15%. And the same type of results if you look at the February half year reporting season, mm. where the best performers, they, they returned around about 30% uh, for the month. And then since then, they've returned 13%. Mm. The worst performers lost about 22% yeah. and have remained So, So them. what you're saying then is if you look at reporting season and look at the best performers, there's a very high likelihood that they'll keep on performing well. Well, it usually points to an underlying strong trend. They're either in an upgrade cycle or there's a structural trend that's working in their favour. On the flip side, if we have a look at those 10 worst performers from August last year, mm. seven out of those 10 continued to fall. Only three managed to see a turnaround. So okay. it's much harder to pick winners from the loser bunch than the winner bunch. Okay, well, you, you, I'm going to have to ask this question then. What have been the really big performers so far? Well, one of the ones that I, I like and I've liked in the past Baby is Baby Bunny. Bunty. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you've said that to me before. Uh, yeah, you know, when four of your biggest competitors go bust and you're yeah. the last one standing, that's a really that's nice thing That's a point you made like when you first brought up to me, Baby Bunty. And we're starting so to reap the benefits. So can keep on going, you reckon? Absolutely. So yeah. what happens initially when companies go bust is there's a bit of a fire sale. So mm. margins actually come under pressure. But after that, uh, that passes, then you start to see the benefits and baby bunting is reaping the benefits now right. where they are seeing a rollout of stores because right. uh, you know there are spaces that are empty because their competitors have gone bust right. and that's a really nice combination to have together with it selling these large ticket items like prams which Boy, are over and are thousand they dollars. I bought one for my grandson <laughs> the other day he was frightening from Melbourne but hell and can, I, <laughs> and can I tell you, Pete, most people don't want to buy these things online because no. they are an engineering feat. It yeah, takes yeah. a PhD to open up one of these prams. Mm. So you actually want to go in store, test it around, work mm. out how to open it, close it, and all the but there are videos bells and... Stuff. <laughs> and sometimes you need them. All right, that's one. Come on, we're, we're, you, you've given us a, a good method for selecting stocks, baby bunny. Give us another good one. Uh, I guess... It, if you have a look at the, the best performing list, um, you've seen some blow uh, the, 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 their results out of the water. And I think a key one to be watching tomorrow is going to be BHP Billiton. Yeah. It's due to come out with its result. And look, one of the major things about the commodity space is not only is it expected to hold up reporting season, but the outlook's going to be quite important. Uh, with BHP, they have a lot of cash. So expect a 55 cent dividend, a 20 cent special dividend, and then that $1 billion worth of cash that they have from that sale to be returned in terms of a share buyback. But the biggest thing from reporting season for me is avoiding those big losers yeah. and one of those biggest losers for me has been U Media. Yeah. Now U Media, you would think that billboards would be a pretty resilient business yeah. but they are tied and to the economic the cycle. Well, aren't they? They're in the elevators, yeah. I think I saw them on the in the elevators coming up to yeah. your floor but um, 
they are dependent on the economy because they are dependent on businesses spending. And it looks like it's the international businesses that are starting to pull back their marketing business mm -hmm. budgets because they are getting a bit nervous about the economic growth environment. So I would say that maybe it's not just U Media that's mm -hmm. impacted, but any of those companies that are geared up towards that global growth uh, story, that it's probably a good time to start being a bit more cautious. What about Blue Sky? Lusco Steel. Mm. Oh, well, that came out today. It wasn't look, good, was it? It wasn't good because we had been expecting to see that the steel spreads mm. um, would have improved for Blue Scope Steel. And that's the key to Blue Scope Steel. The sp steel, steel spread is just the price of, I guess, all the costs that go in, things like iron ore prices, which have been relatively high, and then the price they managed to sell their product at. Mm. And unfortunately, that's been under pressure. Not only that, the key is that the company has said in the first half of this financial year that those steel spreads are expected to weigh on earnings again. The time to pile into Blue Scope Steel is when you see the end of those steel spreads squeezing and, uh, I guess, negatively impacting on earnings and reversing that trend. So this is a company that I would revisit in six months' time, mm. but for the time Because iron ore prices have come down, but the steel, I guess, they're selling today was when iron ore prices were really high. Absolutely. And so I think this will be an interesting one over the next six to 12 months to invest mm. in. But for the time being, the results today really reinforce that the company is still in this downgrade cycle. Okay. You, you now, you're developing a fund, which will be here in the streets in September or so. Um, obviously, you have to have a view on whether the, uh, the US and the world economy is heading towards recession. You can be a negative at times. Though you're a bubbly kind of person, <laughs> I've noticed you can be negative. What is your view on the, the US and the world economy? Well, look, markets have been quite nervous because they saw an inversion of the two-year versus mm. the 10-year Treasury yields. I mean, I guess that's the major curve when you're looking at the inversion of, of yield curves. But it was only for a slight amount of time. And, uh, amount of time. And generally, there's a big lag between the inversion of the yield curve over in the US and the time that recession hits. And that lag is around about 22 months. Mm. So usually in the last leg of a bull market is actually the most, um, I guess, optimistic and mm. the most exciting. Um, you see that exuberance come through. And I don't think we've really seen that exuberance come through. So <coughs> while there are clouds building on the horizon, I still think that the market has a bit to run yet. Don't forget that next year, November 2020, is a presidential election, mm. and that tends to be good news for the US Second stock best year, isn't it? The third year is the best, and it's been a good year this year, hasn't it? Yes. So I guess we, we roll. And I think Donald Trump is a little bit sensitive to stock markets. He doesn't like them going <laughs> down too, too aggressively, does he? And that was one of the reasons why we did see the market rallying today. Some of the comments from him over the weekend mm. um, had the market a bit more optimistic mystic on the US China trade situation, especially given the comments coming out of Apple as well. So look, the tech stocks rallied today. Yeah. They were the best performing sector and the energy sector also looked good. Is there value in those tech stocks? We know they've gone through the roof. I know I, I mentioned on my program when Afterpay got to $11, it seemed like a buying opportunity. <laughs> That's been a long time since we've seen Afterpay at 11. But what do you think? Are they overpriced or are they worth having a go, at least here in the short term, like a bit of money? Look, I think it depends. I, th I think you do have to be selective about the type of technology shares that you are buying. What you want to buy are those companies that continue to grow over, over the next decade, the next two decades, and they have a competitive advantage that can't be withered away because it is a pretty competitive a space. Around them. And what we have found over the last few years is that a rising tide has lifted all ships in that mm. the positive sentiment um, and the exuberance in the technology sector means that everything has gone up. So look, I'd be a little bit more selective and cautious. Okay, I like spot. stocks like Appen or Wise Tech. Okay. Um, the valuations are frothy and high, but if you continue to see growth delivering mm. year after year, in 10 years' time, you know, Cochlear's, I mean, CSL and Cochlear have never been cheap. So, out of well. the wax stock, wax stocks, <laughs> what are your favorites? You've got Wise Tech, Appen. Appen. What about um, they would probably be the, okay. two. the two. With Afterpay, look, um, I've loved Afterpay in the have? past. I'm a bit cautious because it looks like competition is starting to come, come through. Yeah, exactly. I guess that could be a takeover target, but I don't think those guys would so, sell too easily either. Uh, uh, Julia, as always, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Pete. That's Julia Lee from Berman Invest. And coming up, we'll be talking to um, Chris Joy about how scared he is about inverted bond yields and recessions and things like that.
I'm catching up with Chris Joy, who's the portfolio manager at Cooler Bar Capital. And I want to ask him about a lot of things that a lot of us are afraid about, like bond market concerns, the, the potential for an interest rate, uh, for a, a recession linked to interest rates, and all this sort of thing. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, uh, look, you're a bond market specialist, right? And the bond market's been scaring the, the pants off lots of people, and the stock market as well. How afraid are you? about this inverted bond yield? Mate, I don't draw too much from the inverted yield curve. We don't think it has any real predictive capacity. I mean, last year, <clears throat> when yields dropped, everyone was worried about a global recession. And thus far, there has been no sign of that global recession. The yield curve, by which we really mean the market's best guess for cash rates over the next five, 10, 30 years, <clears throat> plus a term premium, which is um, basically some extra yield uh, that compensates you for the uncertainty surrounding interest rates. And that yield curve is a notoriously poor predictor of future cash rate changes. Mm. So I think it's really a function of the fact that people are getting very excited mm. by the Fed cutting rates by the likelihood <coughs> the ECB will cut rates in September. Right. Here in Australia, markets have got very um, animated about the prospect of the RBA cutting the cash rate three times this year. What do you we've, think? Well, we've had two. Um, <coughs> I think it's reasonably likely that we'll get a third. Um, the RBA has really boxed itself, we believe, into a corner. It's argued very consistently that it wants to crush the jobless rate from its current level at four point, uh, sorry, five point two percent, down to between four and four and a half, and that's going to require monetary policy to provide tremendous stimulus to the economy. Um, and we question whether the RBA will get there. Um, certainly, on the basis of the current cuts, whether they should be cutting is a different question. But they are cutting. And that has huge ramifications for Should housing. Should be cutting, Chris? Because that's the, the point. <coughs> we'll just create another housing bubble and a problem for the property market eventually. Well, we've argued consistently. We argued in April that the housing bust was over mm -hmm. after we had predicted in um, early 2017 a 10% drop in national prices. And we think house prices will rise 5 to 10% over the next 12 months after um, the second RBA rate cut. Whether they should or shouldn't, I mean, it's an open question. It's a hard one to answer. What I would say is I definitely think it will be capitalised into house prices. Mm. I think we're going to get a strong recovery um, <coughs> in Property housing. Property and economic recovery? Well, I think we'll get a strong recovery in housing um, this weekend. Mm. The prelimin preliminary clearance rate in Sydney was 81%. Whether that will feed into economic growth, I mean, there will be inevitably some positive spillovers into the Aussie economy. Um, but personally, I don't think they needed to cut, but they have cut. And, you know, you and I, we've got to make money every day um, in a very low yield environment. And I think that's the challenge for investors. Yeah. Are you finding it harder? Because people go to you because term deposits are so low. <coughs> yeah, you're the kind of guy who's looking to try and get 4 or 5%, which is good for a bond fund manager, but it must be coming even harder for you now to get that kind of money. I think it's hard for a lot of people, mm. for sure. I mean, for us, um, in our active composite bond strategy, uh, we only returned 14.3% over the 12 months to July. <laughs> oh, you show off. <laughs> Come on. So that, and that was uh, number one or two in Mercer's survey. And in our active credit alpha strategy, I think we did 10.9%. But this is much the, risky. You can't get 10% without risk. That had some active composite bond. Uh, that strategy had um, some interest rate duration in it. Right. And the active credit alpha strategy um, could invest and did invest in hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, we shifted more than $100 million into hybrids one to two months before the federal election. I mean, people talk about this joker that punted a million bucks on the ALP to win, mm -hmm. Peter but we really put our money where our mouth is. I mean, we, we shifted over $100 million into franked hybrids mm. because we thought SCOMO would win or we thought that the Labor Party, um, if they did win, would only just fall over the line and crucially that the Senate would eviscerate, they'd destroy the franking, the franking proposals. The would start. 
Yeah. Um, but in our strategies, we're not, I mean, your simple bond math is you buy 100 bonds and you get <clears throat> the yield less the fee. So you're basically getting this net return that is just the interest rate on the bonds. Over our last 8,000 plus bond sales, we have generated um, about 4.2% annually in capital gains because what we're expert at doing is finding what we call mispriced bonds <coughs> that are paying too much interest. And when that interest rate normalizes down to our target, we get a capital gain. So I don't buy bonds for their yield. I don't chase yield. <coughs> I look for mispriced cheap bonds mm. that will give me that capital gain, yeah. um, which can be significant at 4% okay, annually. Okay, just not boasting how great you are. What, what we can worry about, <coughs> if you thought a recession was coming, 2020, for example. Yeah, I don't think any recession's coming in Good, 2020. okay, 2021. But let me explain why. No, 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 yeah. Good. So <clears throat> I've argued for the last two to three years that we are mid-cycle, mm. not late cycle. Mm. All the two smart by halves. So the bull market's got a long time to go. <clears throat> I've argued that we're late cycle. I think at the slightest sign of adversity, central banks will cut, and that's what they've done. I think they'll print money and they'll buy assets and they'll keep on pushing yields down further and further and further until, and the only thing that I think can really stop this cycle, two things can stop it. We could have a catastrophic, you know, completely cataclysmic trade war mm. that could send the world careening into a global recession. That's not our central case. No. And every time the market has thought that, I've bought assets and then, <clears throat> because when the markets move into that risk off mode, they tend preternaturally to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. So we buy those cheap assets and then when they've normalized, we've sold them. My central case is that Trump wants to um, be perceived to be tough on China. I'm not convinced Trump actually wants to do a deal with China. What he does want to do is slap China with tariffs, which is what he has done. And what the hawks in Washington want to do is shift supply chains out of China to more friendly nation states. There is an emerging consensus in Washington um, <clears throat> that tr China will never be a trusted partner. And there is a consensus that there must be indivisibility between economic security and national security. And that means the US has to decouple from China. <clears throat> Having said that, um, Trump, I don't think, wants to blow up the US economy no. before the 2020 election. So that's why he's jawboning the Fed so hard. And I think you'll see more Fed cuts. I think you'll see a lot of stimulus. Um, and in a world where long-term risk-free rates are so low, I think that'll be quite positive, certainly for our assets. So for financial credit or bonds issued by financial issuers, mm. um, which historically remain very cheap. Mm. You know, CBA on its senior bonds is paying today seven times in spread terms what it paid in 2007. Mm. All right, now, given all that, the scenario that a house price <coughs> Armageddon linked to the fact that Australia's household debt to GDP is the second highest in the world, what's your commentary on that? Well, we call the boom between 2012 and 2017 when the Steve Keynes and the John Adams of the world were preaching Armageddon. I called the bust in 2017 when prices were still rising. And that 10% drawdown was the biggest in 40 years. Mm. But we also called the rebound in April this year <clears throat> when prices were still falling. Mm. And I think you're going to see a strong recovery. I think house prices are heading in one direction. My central case is there will be no global recession in the next year or two. The risk to that case mm. is China and the US, so that mm. is a risk. But, if, but this if, whole, this well, whole... Wait, so let me finish. Yeah. You yeah. can't talk over the top of me, big fella. Yeah, I always Otherwise, do. Otherwise, I'll have to dust you up. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, no, my... Um, uh, I, th I think if... Let's just deal with that risk. <clears throat> so if we got a global recession... Um, I think you, you could see Aussie house prices fall again. 
it's not clear that you get an Aussie recession, but if we did get a, a deep Aussie recession of the kind we experienced in 91, I think house prices would fall by 30%. Uh, or thereabouts, within a range of... But the top of up 10 and they come back third. <coughs> well, they've, they're up 50% mm. uh, from 2012 through to 2017. Yeah. Net, they're still up 40 because they gave back 10. And yeah, at some point in the future, there could be a recession where they give back a lot. I think in the next serious Aussie recession, Aussie house prices are going to fall by you know, 20 to 40%. Um, I think if we get a global recession that it, it triggers a severe Aussie recession... That, that scenario would play out. But I don't think we're gonna get a, a global recession. I don't think we're gonna get an Aussie recession. And personally, I think Aussie housing is gonna perform very strongly in the next one to three years. And I'm looking for strong house price appreciation. Okay. My forecast, ahead of any other analyst in the com- country in April. And note this everybody. <coughs> We will come back to this. We, yeah. we boast about it. was a 5 to 10% rise in prices mm. over the next 12 months. They're already up almost 1% off their, um, their trough in circa uh, May this year. And um, so I think the Aussie housing market will perform well. But I would emphasize, as with everything, that you know we're looking at the world as a distribution of future outcomes. So there are many potential states of nature. And there are tails. So there are those risks where house, housing could suffer a negative you know, 20 to 40% shock. But I'm feeling very, very positive about resi property. And I think anyone betting against the Aussie housing, pro, uh, housing market um, over the next uh, 12 months is very, very foolhardy indeed, particularly with us staring down the barrel of um, more RBA rate cuts. Okay. So that's Chris Joy. I've got to say, you know, we read him in the Fin Review every weekend. <coughs> You don't understand him because he's just off with the pixies. But when you get a chance to talk to him, you bring him back to earth. Chris, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, mate. Kate Carnell, thanks for joining us on Switzer. It's a pleasure, Peter. So, Kate, a lot of people don't really understand, A, your title and what you precisely do. So tell us the official title and tell us what the main role you have. Okay, Peter, I have the worst title in the world. It's the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. We won't even go to why it's called that, but I think it might have been something to do with a captain's call in the Prime Minister of the day's office. That said, I have two roles uh, um, under legislation. So my role is statutory. That means I'm appointed by the Governor-General and I don't um, report directly to the the government um, of the day, but I have to comply with the legislation. The legislation has two roles. One is an assistance role and that's more traditional ombudsman type role, you know, looking after people with a problem. And the other one is the unusual one, and that's advocacy. And that gives us the legislative responsibility to ensure that legislation and regulation is small business and family enterprise, um, on, uh, uh, family enterprise uh, appropriate. Uh, and it also gives us the capacity to do inquiries with um, mini Royal Commission powers. So I can mm. make big business give me contracts and, uh, and um, papers and things and evidence I need to be able to investigate things like unfair contracts. We did an inquiry into banks, uh, banks and their, their interface with small business and also things like payment times. Okay, so, so does that really mean that Kate, if, if a small business had a, a particularly serious 
battle with a bigger business and it seemed as though the big business was using bullying tactics, you could actually approach that business to, to work out whether the accusations against them are fair and if they are proven, can you penalise them? Um, okay, Peter, so what we do is if somebody, if a business comes to us and says, look, um, we're dealing with this particular uh, big business, uh, they're not delivering on what they said they deliver, they're charging us too much, they've got unfair contract terms, in other words, they're behaving badly and using their power then, yeah. um, inappropriately, um, we will then pick up that case. Uh, we'll initially write to the bigger business outlining the issues um, sometimes we'll do that um, in the first instance anonymously um, if the small business is worried about, you know, about uh, being named. But yeah. we'll also follow up on behalf of the small business. We'll ask them for, to, um, to give us the background of this, to give us their side of the story, shall we say. Uh, we'll see what happens then. Then we can ask to see a copy of the contract. Uh, and we actually do have the power to require them to provide that. If they mm. don't, uh, although we don't have, uh, can I say, our, the penalties we can ap apply aren't all that high, uh, but uh, they're, they, they can be a criminal charge. Mm. We also have the legislative power to name and shame, which I have to say with big businesses often really matters. Mm. Most definitely. And so... When a big business hears that you're on the beat and, um, and you're, you're hot to trot to do something about it, have you found that capitulation can sometimes occur and a decent uh, and, uh, settlement results? Uh, Peter, there's two types. One is the ones that capitulate immediately. It's like, right. oops, got it wrong. Here's the money. We'll fix it. They're yeah. the sensible ones because I tell you what, we don't give up. My office is, is you know, we're a, a bull at a gate, shall we say, on this stuff. Mm. So if initially they give us, one would say, a whole heap of waffle, you know, on how wonderful they are and so on, we go back and we go back and we keep going until uh, we start issuing summonses to produce and all sorts of things, at um, which stage most businesses, 99%, um, say, oh, well, yeah, okay, fair cop, you know, we'll, mm. uh, you know, we'll do what we, what, what you've asked us to do. And we don't ask them to do unreasonable things, you know, we're just mm. asking them to behave, you know, in a business-like fashion and treat small businesses with, uh, in a business-like way with a level of respect. So we don't go, you know, we don't go out on a limb on this stuff. Um, on the few occasions where that hasn't happened, or I should say, at the end of the day, we can require mediation. So we can require the businesses to um, enter into mediation. We have a list of, of mediators uh, that we have vetted to make sure they're okay. Um, and quite a number of, of our cases that aren't fixed immediately go to mediation. If that doesn't work, then we can publish their names, that they, were, that they, they refuse to enter into mediation and refuse to um, cooperate. Okay. Have you, have you experienced a lot of um, uh, complaints about either telcos or IT tech companies um, actually um, making life hard for small businesses because of failures of servers and um, telecommunication systems and things like that? And when complaints are delivered to the bigger business, they virtually just blame the smaller business and tell them they'll charge them more to fix up the problem, which they seemingly might have created. Is this something that you're seeing develop over the last few years? Look, we have, Peter, and we do um, send those, where appropriate, send those complaints to the telecommunications industry ombudsman um, uh, but we always say to people, look, if you don't get the outcomes, well, you might not get the outcomes, but if you don't get the service that you expect, come back to us because we are here to support small businesses. But I'd have to say uh, the telecommunication industry ombudsman is, uh, is doing a good job and is focusing on focusing much more than was the case uh, a few years ago on some of these small business issues. 
the areas that we're getting um, that don't fit into that case, and that would be the IT providers, you know, people who are fixing uh, computers, people who are providing advertising, you know, uh, online advertising and so on are different, and we are getting a significant increase in companies that are promising small businesses all sorts of things in terms of, uh, of online advertising, getting their name out, getting numbers of hits, likes, all those sort of things that simply aren't delivering at all. And I think it's a major, major issue. So it's sort of good to see the ACCC uh, come down with their um, inquiry outcomes on some of the big platforms. Because I tell you what, Peter, some of the platforms are doing some pretty ordinary things in comparison to banning particular small businesses from advertising on their sites. Mm. Uh, their money is being taken for advertising and they're simply not getting... Uh, the priority or the the prominence that they were promised. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done here, and it matters for small businesses. Yeah, without a doubt. Now you've actually uh, initiated a, a major um, a, a initiative today involving um, the workplace. Look, that's true. You know, the single biggest complaint, probably after the banks and financial institutions that we yeah. get from small businesses. Uh, is the complexity of the industrial relations system. You know, Peter, it's quarter of a million words, the Fair Work Act, quarter of a million words, 960 sections, and that's before we even get on to the 122 modern awards. Um, this is just too difficult for small businesses. Mm. So we are um, launching a discussion paper, which is more than that, actually, but we're, um, we're launching a paper today that is... Uh, um, looking at the fair, the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code. Now, when the Fair Work Act was uh, was brought into uh, was brought in in 2009, that was under the Labor government. It was updated in 2011, still under a, a Labor government. They put in a, a Small Business Fair Dismissal Code because they said and understood that the current Act was just too difficult for small businesses to understand how they could dismiss somebody if things didn't work. Unfortunately, mm. the Fair Dismissal Code um, has been subject to um, legal attack, in other words, lawyers trying to pull it apart, um, and also some issues in the Commission itself. So it needs to be rewritten to, it, to achieve its initial um, approach. So I'd certainly hope that the Labor Party and even the unions support this because we're just trying to make it work the way the, uh, the, the Rudd and Gillard governments actually wanted it uh, to work. We've, yeah. redra we've got a redraft, we've got new checklists, uh, we've made it easy, so we're out there right now for, uh, for a conversation on whether this approach would ensure small businesses have clear guidelines in what they've got to do to fairly dismiss an employee. Yeah. Have, have unions responded to some of your early comments around this? Uh, on the whole, um, not very positively, uh, Peter. It seems that any change in the industrial relations system uh, is difficult to, uh, to achieve. Uh, and I think that's uh, what the current minister, Christian Porter, has been saying, that we really need to have a proper consultation, you know, proper um, conversation in the community on this because the current act is incredibly complex. And if we want small businesses, remember 99% of businesses turn over under 10 million, and that's the ATO um, definition of small business. So the vast percentage of businesses are, are small. They don't have HR sections. They don't have in-house lawyers. They, you know, they do this themselves. If we want small businesses to employ people, you know, either full-time or part-time and reduce their use of contractors uh, and casuals, then we've got to make it easier to employ. And that means easier to dismiss if things don't go well. So if I'd have to say if the unions and others really wanted um, to, de, you know, to have more, more you know, permanent full-time or part-time employees in our system, they, we've simply got to change the current approaches in the Act for small businesses. Do small businesses make 
a lot of mistakes when it comes to dismissing workers? Look, you know, the reality is because this can be lawyers at 20 paces, what might seem like a really little um, mistake or um, and a mistake would be a wrong way to put it, but a, a different interpretation to the Act can end up meaning a small business ends up with a case in the Fair Work Commission. Now, we hear time and time again, uh, Peter, by the way, about 14,000 cases of unfair dismissal happen in the Fair Work Commission um, every, every year, so it's a lot, um, and we hear from lots of small businesses that, uh, look, it's just easier to pay what they call go-away money um, than to take the risk of having a full-blown case in the Fair Work Commission. So the sort of things that happen is the current code in its current form um, indicates that a person can, you know, a person who's been dismissed can have um, a support person with them um, for, you know, for the dismissal process if they choose. Um, now, that's fine, um, but the, the interpretation of that has been that, um, that the person at times doesn't even have to ask for that, that the employer is supposed to know that they want one, um, they want somebody. So, you know, although it seems clear that they can have it, um, therefore they should ask for it, um, the interpretation has, been, has put the onus back on the employer at times. So there are little things like that, mm. but that can take a case all the way in to the Fair Work Commission and require, you know, the costs of lawyers and the costs of time. Okay. Now, Kate, one, one last area. Uh, ever since I've been, you know, reporting on small business, and that's been at least since 1988, um, Everyone has complained about red tape and governments and opposition parties have always promised to get rid of red tape. Seriously, is there anything really being done to reduce the workload on small business? I hate that question, Peter, because the answer really is no. Yeah, um, um, I, I'd love to be able to say, you know, yes, huge amounts is done. I'm pleased that Christian Porter is talking about looking at the Fair Work Act to try to simplify it, but it hadn't happened yet. Mm. Um, and just recently, um, the, um, the ATO has introduced single-touch payroll. Now, single-touch payroll means that small business have to tell the ATO um, about the amount of PAYG um, and superannuation money that they have withheld from an employee's salary when they pay, you know, when the wage, when wages are paid, and they've got to have an electronic system to do that. Now, down the track somewhere, this might be a good thing, but I tell you what, right now, for a lot of small businesses that um, don't have electronic pay, um, wages systems, um, this is a big uh, impost. I was talking to a butcher the other day and just outside Canberra, uh, you know, who's a family business, been there forever, you know, he's actually got a farm as well, so he sells his own meat, you know, great, great yeah. sort of, you know, business. He he doesn't have an electronic wages system, but he does have uh, more than five employees when you count casuals, which means that from, well, from the 1st of July and with an extension to September, he's got to have an electronic system um, in place to be able to send the ATO this, this information. Um, you know, that's a really tough gig for lots mm. of small businesses. And even for the ones with zero to four, in, well, for one to four employees, they can get their tax agent or their BAS agent or whatever to do this return um, for a couple of years. But even then, they, with one employee, you will have to do this. Now, get the reason, but I have to say these are the sorts of things that just put more red tape on top of small businesses, which is a problem. Yeah. Now, Kate, just one last thing. If someone needs help from your unbelievably long title, but we just call it the small business ombudsman, what do they do? How, how do they get, get you to help them? Uh, look, we are there to help them. We're there to find the right door in government. So often people ring us because they just don't know who to get in touch with. Um, and we can help them with that if they've got a problem with big business. If they've got a problem with the ATO, and many people do, uh, we can... Um, question, the, the answer to that one is, if you've got a problem with the ATO, please get in touch with us early 
don't wait for the thing to, you know, for, for, for everything to have progressed to a really bad state. We have lots of things we can do. So go to our, our website. There's a phone number where you talk to a real human uh, um, or alternatively there's a capacity to enter your um, dispute um, into um, our dispute resolution tool. But, you know, the fact is we're people, all of my staff have small business backgrounds. They understand the space and uh, we really want to help. Kate, thanks for joining us on the program. Thanks very much, Peter. It's our weekly catch up with Charlie Aiken and Paul Rickard to see what they're seeing in the markets that maybe all of us are missing. Charlie, welcome back from Spain. Looking like a pretty cool Spanish kind of guy. <laughs> you know, obviously when you go away for two weeks, there's always market turmoil. That's how it works. So yeah. come back and you know, a few prices are a few different, but I think there's you know, great opportunity in some of this. Yeah, Paul, do you think it's a buying opportunity now or are you sitting on your hands? Look, we're waiting to buy still, Peter. Um, I, I quite like the market. I think we've had a nice little dip but uh, I think we're going to get through a bit more of August and the reporting season locally, Peter. Mm -hmm. So reporting season started well, gone off the boil a little bit the last couple of days, but mm -hmm. it's not a disaster. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think there's a, the jury's just out a little bit at the moment. Ashar, you're the kind of guy who would buy with uh, all the problems in Hong Kong. Are you buying the Hang Seng Index or anything like that? Well, thankfully, we reduced that actually earlier a couple of months ago on the first bit of turmoil up there. And the Hang Seng Index and the Hang Seng China Enterprise Index is probably about down 10 to 12% from the peak. So we actually thankfully reduced our weightings there. We're just thinking about that. Mm. I mean, I think there's opportunity there. I, I just, I've got to be sensible though, because it, it hasn't been resolved yet. There's no. still 1.7 million people protesting on the weekend, mm. but there is cheaper prices and price is what attracts us in valuation. So I'm thinking about it. Well, right? Lord Rothschild, any hint for yeah, Lord Rothschild, what did he say? Buy on cannons, sell on victory trumpets. Well, yeah. we're somewhere near cannons up there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Hopefully we're not at cannons. Yeah. But look, I, I think there's opportunity, but you need to be sensible. Like, there's been good results come out of Alibaba in recent days, so in good results out of Ping An. And, and, you're, and you're in those. Yeah, and out, okay results out of ten cents. So look, the, the fundamentals of the companies are okay up there, but sentiment's still very black. Is very, a trade deal hurting some of the companies that you're you're well, involved in? It's, it's hurt the price, but then Ping An Insurance, no. Revenue up 67%. Alibaba, revenue up 30%. No. Yeah. In fact, they were better than expected. So yeah. is it hurting Caterpillar and John Deere in America? Yes, it is. Mm. Has it hurt Boeing a little bit and things? Yes, it has. So it's, you can't say the trade war is having no effect, but it's, it's not specifically on certain Chinese things. Well, Paul, when we talk to our financial planning clients and we show them the, the traffic lights mm -hmm. and what markets look good, and emerging markets are really down, and there's a lot of it because of China's problems with the trade deal. Mm -hmm. If a trade deal was struck, would you think emerging markets would get a big comeback? So they've maybe there's a speculative contrarian yeah, look, I play. Mean, emerging markets also generally do better out of when the, it's very much US dollar related as well, Peter. You've got okay. to be very careful uh, because of the, a lot of tie to the US dollar in terms of their economies mm. uh, and their currencies. So they tend to, when you, people are putting money in the US dollar, that can be a positive for US emerging markets and vice versa. So a trade might. deal would take the dollar up, wouldn't it? Trade deal should be better for the US dollar. I mean, it should be better for US growth, should mm. be more uh, faster growth, maybe interest rates not coming down as quickly. Mm. Uh, so I think you've just got to be a little bit careful. But I, look, I think emerging markets, yeah, they're not, they're looking reasonably attractive, Peter, but I'm just not sure people are ready to the, the walk away from The question comes is, do you need to be there? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, yeah. I, I think if there is a trade deal, and I think it would be a token one at best if Trump's feeling under pressure, it'll be some sort of handshake thing that probably mm -hmm. means nothing. But Americans will buy American equities. That's what they'll yep, do. They, they will do. buy Caterpillar. They will buy Boeing. They will buy Apple. They will buy all the things. So you're they saying know. get the companies well, that have been struggling to trade. Well, I think you're better off buying beaten up American cyclicals that have a global facing element or some trade element because mm. that's what Americans will buy. Mm. They're, they're not going to necessarily come to Hong Kong or go and buy Argentina. They're, they're probably going to buy Caterpillar. Okay. Would be my view. Yeah, yeah no, I agree with that. I mean, we talk about the hometown bias. Mm. You know, the hometown bias in the US is even bigger. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's probably better opportunities and safer opportunities. Mm. One of the trouble with emerging markets, the volatility is, you know, mm. you saw what happened in, in Argentina last week um, with the, just a cha not even a change of government, but just a poor poll result, and mm. suddenly the market collapses well, by me, 30%. I, 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 yeah. uh, you, know, you don't get that with the US. So yeah. it's, I, I learned my lesson in emerging markets last year with too much Hong Kong exposure. When it goes against you, the liquidity dries up, 
There isn't a marginal buyer. At least in the United States, you have buybacks that kick in, and there's, there's a, there is a marginal buyer, and a bit of it's the home bias, but it's also the 50% weighting in the index. It's America. Mm. But to me, it's um, I'm just not sure. I think, Ameri- I think American equities, look at it this month. S&P down 3%, might be up a bit tonight, hopefully, if the futures are right. You know, uh, Europe down about 5%, Asia down about 6 or 7%, Australia down 6%, give or take 1% today. The American market's outperforming on the down months and outperforming on the up months, and it's because it's got better growth. Well, when you, when you were young and foolish, Charlie, you know, about a year <laughs> yeah, ago, a year yeah, you were punting on a Brexit play. Are you still thinking that there's some money to be made with a Brexit No, I'm, I am just waiting for Brexit. I was in London last week, actually. There's a lot of nervousness there yeah, that, 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 that the true hard Brexit is on. Mm. Now, the true hard Brexit, people don't really know what happens there, but it's probably not positive in the short term. Mm. So I think there'll be great opportunities in UK equities, but just wait till the 31st of October, a few days after that. You might get some, you know, some uh, some uh, dis- what would you call it? You know, some opportunity in yeah. in that mess. A big mess. buying opportunity. Yeah, I'm waiting there yeah. because I don't think anyone. I think people still don't believe Johnson's actually going to do a hard Brexit. No joke. Yeah. But he probably is. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I think wait for the UK. I mean, interesting. The pound was up last week. Mm. I can't quite work that one out. Mm. Uh, but uh, look, I think wait. I mean, I think the uh, look. He, Brig- Johnson's certainly talking like he wants to do. Whether Parliament can actually stop him or not? Mm. Question mark. There's a lot to play out between now and the 31st of October. If they do, they're clearly not prepared for it. So it's going to be, um, I think there's going to be some good opportunities here. If anything, if I was in the UK, I'd say get over and done with because yeah. you just think it's, this thing just dragging yeah, on right. does Crazy. no one any favours. Yeah. Look, I just think the Eurozone in the UK, a little bit different to the US at the moment. I mean, when Wall Street was getting hammered on Wednesday, Trump called in the three CEOs, yeah, the three yeah, biggest yeah. investment banks. Mm. Yeah. If that tells you nothing, Trump is very attuned to the share market. Yeah. He wants it up, yeah. right? So... The markets have recovered you know, on Wall Street since that phone call. So yes. that, yeah, and, and they'll probably be up again tonight by the look of things. Mm. So I think that's really interesting. You've got a pro-markets, whatever you think of Trump, he's pro-markets and he mm. judges himself by markets. Mm. They've got the hammer on the Federal Reserve. The Fed's now behind the, behind the, you know, the curve, literally, mm. in terms of bonds. They'll cut rates in, in, in next month. Mm. And this actually gets interesting. I, still think, I just think you probably don't need to take the risk outside of US equities at the okay. moment. You don't Given need to that- much. What's the stock you like, Charlie? People watch this show want to know. No, what's still a big, I think I wrote to you last week from Spain about Alphabet, the parent of Google. I think that's a, a good investment. I think a good long-term investment looks reasonable. Stocks held up well in this correction. Looks good value, you know, growing nicely, and, and and it will probably compensate you. So that's the sort of thing I own. Google, Microsoft. I'm trying to not overcomplicate at the moment. The temptation is to buy UK stocks before Brexit mm. or go and buy Hong Kong where there's still. You know, still turmoil in the streets. I just don't think you need to You're do it. You're becoming old and mature, Charlie. That's oh, really that's sad. <laughs> Paul? Well, two things. I think CSL report was really strong last week. We said so at the time. That's a stock for weakness. You may not buy it today, but mm. market sell-offs, it's got to be a core stock in everyone's portfolio. It is Australia's best company. There yeah. is no one close to it. So uh, that's the first one. Secondly, though, I think, Peter, you wrote a great story today in the Switzer Super Report about, I think, a very pro-bank story. Mm. I mean, I think that the... As you pointed out, the ASIC's loss on responsible lending, mm. that's really good for Australian banks. Mm. Uh, and the yields, you know, if you look at them, are still pretty attractive. You know, yeah. they're, they're grossing mm. up to over 8%. If, it, if, if the Fed cuts rates and we actually go for more rate cuts here, bank yields are going to look phenomenal. Now, we know that, you know, interest rates going down is bad for banks. We know there's not much growth out there. But put that to side, if they can master, get their cost under control and even be growthless, mm. But, you know, they're going to look super attractive. Yeah. So I think banks are starting to look, if I had to one area of the market where I'd, just, I'd be more comfortable being overweight mm. on a risk-adjusted basis, because I don't think you get killed if the market goes the other way, mm. I think banks are starting to look okay. Yeah, exactly right. And, and I think the, the, the important point is this, that if we do have an economic comeback in the second half, which a lot of economists think we will, well, banks will get more business at a time when, Hopefully, responsible lending will be re- 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 replaced with sensible lending. Yeah, I that's why I think this. I would call that a bit of Switzerism. <laughs> sensible lending yeah. from Switzerland. Is that well, right? To be honest, the Royal Commission yeah. came at, a, at the right time. There was some pretty loose lending. We're probably heading towards a, a bit of a you know a debt crisis. Quite frankly, people are taking on way too much debt. People are faking their mortgage applications. I think the Royal Commission has probably been a great thing for responsible lending. Mm. And in, in that, if you think about share prices and bank investment, that's that's a very good thing. Yeah. But I think it has had a cost though, Charlie, mm. and it, clearly the banks tightened up everywhere. Sure. All the anecdote about not just homeowners, but small business finding it really tough to get yeah. loans. It's gone to the other extreme. 
this turns it back a little bit and I think it gives mm. the, the banks a little more confidence to say, yeah, look, we, we, we can't know anything about you, but we can, we can take it to a certain level and make sure that uh, get, get some, some money back out there. So I think it's a real positive for banks in the, okay. in the medium term. Well, that's Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management, who are apparently you're doing better than you have in the past, Charlie. Well I'm done. Coming good again, Peter. Coming good, coming good. And Paul Rickard from the Switzerland Report.